clear. We do not expect harmful levels of radiation to reach the West Coast, Hawaii, Alaska, or U.S. territories in the Pacific. That is the judgment of our Nuclear Regulatory Commission and many other experts. Furthermore, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and public health experts do not recommend that people in the United States take precautionary measures beyond staying informed. And going forward, we will continue to keep the American people fully updated because I believe that you must know what I know as president. The Reagan aircraft carrier was the most dangerous mission the Navy has ever seen. Battling an enemy it could not see, hear, or touch. 420 sailors were sick. Nine sailors had died from cancer. California judge has thrown out the sailors' case against GE and TEPCO. Told them to go to TEPCO in Japan for compensation. Yeah, that's not happening. You see, denying the sailors of the Reagan is essential to keeping the lies alive that Fukushima is safe. It was the sailors of the Reagan that got real measurements of how bad the Fukushima plume was. They gave their lives to get the information back to the government in America. The only people that the Reagan's information protected, however, were the elites in Washington. So after Obama gave his Rose Garden speech saying radiation would not reach the shores of the United States, flew his family to Brazil hours later. And Hillary told her staff to stay indoors, not attend any events outside, and to wear a mask. Meanwhile, St. Patty's Day's parades were being held across the country, and the western United States began being hammered by Fukushima radioactive clouds. Reagan's warnings were meant to protect all of us, not just the elite. Michael Seabomb was a radiation officer. He had seen lots of parts wear out during 17 years as a naval aircraft mechanic. Many of the helicopters that he serviced at the Asuga saw heavy use and parts were replaced to ensure safety and maximum performance. But during Operation Tamadachi, helicopter parts, particularly the radiators and the air ducts, were replaced after just about every flight because of the huge amounts of radioactive particles sucked into the engine. You couldn't put the radiator back in, said Seaborn. It had to be replaced. We dumped it into a barrel full of water and soap and set the barrel behind a barrier like a police line. Then every day we would take measurements to see if any of the radiation was seeping through. The barrels gave off radiation. It takes years and years for the material to decay on its own. We would take off on our tie suits and cut them off and put them into the barrels too. Everything that had seals or were dirty had to go into the radiation barrels since that's what the radiation sticks to. The more we put into the barrels, the more the radiation grew. It seemed to feed onto itself. That was a hectic 80 day period in the spring of 2011, which Seaborn thought was behind him forever. He was wrong. His eight year old son Kaya got mysteriously ill in May of 2011. He went through vomiting fits and missed three weeks of school, said Seaborn. They had a rule that if you threw up, you were sent home, and he would throw up 10 15 times a day. He didn't feel bad, but he couldn't stop vomiting. Eventually, they just wrote it off with stress. He still has these episodes, and they never have been able to evaluate what does it. The sea bomb was fine until last year. In March 2012, I got some medical problems which the Navy doctors couldn't explain, he said. The right side of my body is at 40% to 50% of its normal strength. I've had two MRIs, I've had x rays, ultrasound. They can't figure out what's going on with me. My arms, chest, and shoulders are sore, and I'm getting disproportionately big on my left side, which is odd since I'm right-handed and use that side more. Neither he nor Kai received genetic counseling or monitoring. The Navy covers only Seabomb's health care for five years, and after that I'm on my own. Once you get out of the military, you're still covered for a little while, but your family members are not. And after those five years are over, that's a wonderful question, says Seaboom, who continues to get weaker on his right side as that part of his body is aging prematurely. It's understood that the Tamadachi Registry for the 70,000 servicemen and family members was supposed to help out with that. If we came down with health problems 10 to 15 years down the road, we should be able to be eligible for health care since it's related to our service. 
but at this last moment, the DLD scraped the program, so I don't know what's going to happen to us. Part of the reason for joining this suit against TEPCO was to ensure that the nuclear power company took responsibility for the damage it caused and covered future healthcare needs. I'm not upset with the Navy about the radiation. They had no idea what was going on, because we have never dealt with this. The Navy did the best they could. We were all flying blind, navigating the bureaucracy. As the USS Ronald Reagan and Satanic Strike Force 7 sped away from Japan at the conclusion of Operation Tamodachi, Navigators Plem and Ennis felt a sense of relief. It was over. They were told by radiation inspection teams that were safe. They didn't test us for any internal contamination or anything, said Plim. They just ran a machine over our skin. They never did any blood tests or any other type of tests. We were out there for 80 days, said Ennis. Now I realized I had small lumps on my lower jaw. I went to see if I could get it checked out, but by then the radiation expert had been flown off the ship. After that, I started getting bad stomach ulcers, and two more lumps appeared, one on my lower thigh, and one between my eyes. The Reagan head for Puget Sound for a year of decontamination and general overhaul. Ennis, who had listed just for four years, enrolled in the Olympic College. Edmonton, Washington. One of the big things you say in the Navy, Ennis recalled, was when I get out, I'm going to let my hair grow and have a big beard. That's because while you're in the Navy, you have to have that tight skin face and hair. Well, I grew up my hair and had a goatee, and then my hair started falling out. I rarely comb my hair now because if I do, gobs of it come out in a comb. And I find my right hand shaking when I'm riding. Ennis, strapping a 6 foot 2 inch athlete, was an MVP of the Olympic College football team. And his time in the 400 meter dash was within 2 seconds of the 2012 Olympic qualifying time. Now he has trouble finding the energy to make it through the day. I'm only 25, he said, and my body's breaking down. I shouldn't be hurting like I am hurting now. I went out of my way to take care of my body, and now it's like switches are being turned off and on inside of me. It makes me feel like an old man, and I don't like it. I don't know what radiation may be doing in my body, but I know I didn't bring this upon myself. He has been informed by the Navy that they lost his medical records, and there's no way to trace his current problems to his service on the USS Ronald Reagan. His medical needs, therefore, will not be covered. For Plin, the problems at first seemed to be a nuisance. My menstrual cycle completely went away for the six months, she said. They gave me a hundred million pregnancy tests because they couldn't figure out why it stopped. But I wasn't pregnant. And then six months later, it came back so heavily, I went to the emergency room because I was hemorrhaging and losing so much of my blood, I was fainting. It's as if, she said, a reoccurring phenomenon with no apparent medical explanation. A normal menstrual period suddenly morphs into rapid, uncontrolled bleeding, requiring medical intervention in a hospital. In March of 2012, she developed asthma and had the first six bouts of bronchitis before she left the Navy in December. The Navy does not consider a gynecological problem to be service-related. The possibility of inhaling radioactive particles might have affected Plin's lung problems and was ruled out when the Defense Department decided that there was no health problems caused by the participation in Operation Tamadachi. So she too has no health insurance. Part of me wants to believe that the Navy wouldn't deliver do something to hurt the crew, she said. I remember the few bits of news we got during that period, and the Japanese said there was no danger from the power plant. The radiation didn't leak out that day, they said, and they had it all under control. The Japanese lied, and I put the blame on them. Ennis, however, is torn. The Japanese lied to our government, he said, and a part of me wants to think that the Navy wouldn't do that to the crew, that they wouldn't put us in a dangerous situation like that on purpose. But then there's part of me that says they just did that. U.S. sailors face grim diagnosis at the Fukushima mission. To serve in the U.S. Armed Forces, you must meet certain health and fitness requirements. You must be fit to serve. But a healthy group of young servicemen and women, men in their 20s, have come down with serious health problems since serving on a humanitarian mission to Fukushima. Japan, following the 2011 earthquake and tsunami that led to a nuclear meltdowns of the Tokyo Electric Power Company at TEPCO Nuclear Power Plant. Service members have faced cancer, brain tumors, birth defects, and other rare health problems since being exposed to radiation from the Fukushima plant. 
Some have even died. Courthouse News talked to some of these service members to find out what's happened since they came home from Fukushima and what they believe TEPCO needs to take responsibility. It was a gray smoke that surrounded you and you didn't even know what it was. Naval Officer Angel Torres, 47, said he knew his mission to South Korea would be redirected to Fukushima. As soon as he heard about the earthquake, he was aboard the USS Ronald Reagan, the first aircraft carrier deployed by the United States to Fukushima as part of the humanitarian mission Operation Tamadachi to render aid and supplies to the Japanese people. He said when the ship arrived, he got this eerie feeling. It was like a cloud I'd never seen, a gray smoke that surrounded you, and I didn't even know what it was, Torres said. Torres said once the Navy personnel realized they directed the aircraft carrier straight through a radioactive plume. There was confusion and a sense of panic. People brought up all the Gatorade and water at the ship's stores and feared that there wouldn't be any more water available. He said they had to drive back through the plume a second time to render aid and were issued gas masks to wear. Helicopters which took supplies to people on land were completely contaminated, Torres said. Helicopter pilots and personnel were required to throw out their clothes, scrub down, and get tested for radiation. We've all volunteered to join and sometimes you have to do dangerous things, and this was one of them, Torres said. It was our turn. The naval officer said, Commanders told the service members the amount of radiation they were expected to was negligible. Similar to flying an airplane or eating a banana. Torres said the executive officers of the ship even told the crew they'd be fine unless they licked the flight deck. They did well, try to pacify us and stabilize the sentiment and the general feeling throughout the ship, but I don't know what I agree with that one bit because I've eaten a lot of bananas, Torres said. Nathan Patowski was in Malaysia on a rest stop when his crew on the USS Essex got word of the tsunami and headed towards Fukushima. He was part of a team that landed to deliver food and supplies and they wore biological chemical suits. Some areas were completely destroyed. It looked like a wall had smashed everything and a hand drew everything back out to sea. The crew members were also required to take iodine pills to help mitigate radiation exposure and potential thyroid impacts. It closed up all the windows and hatches on the ship as well. Radiation impacts on sailors' health. Talski led the Marine Corps shortly after his service in Fukushima. He began exhibiting extreme weight loss, limbs, swelling mouth months later. In November of 2012, he experienced eyesight loss and vomited stomach acid before going to the emergency room on Christmas Day. He was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia at the age of 21. The type of leukemia I had usually is something you get later in life. Early onset can be caused from being around certain types of chemicals, Kostik said. The following days and months included chemotherapy treatments, but after his leukemia came back less than six months into remission, the Marine received a stem cell transplant. He since faced day-long doctor appointments with specialists, which required him to take off work and travel out of town. Kostik dis. Disputes TEPCO's contention the service members who face cancer and other health problems since returning from Fukushima were predisposed to those conditions. The utility claims their health problems are not from the radiation exposure. If that were the case, TEPCO would have disseminated all the information it should have, Kotowski said, referring to the utility's initial withholding of information after the nuclear meltdown. If we were predisposed to genetic mutation or illness, why lie and cover things up? When Torres returned from Fukushima, he said he felt weak and tired, and he didn't feel like being intimate with his significant other. Something out of the ordinary, given what Torres called the honeymoon effect. When a service member returns home from deployment and when working out six months after coming home, Torres got a hernia which required surgery. Two years later, he had another one. I thought, oh my gosh, I am breaking down here. What's going on? Torres said. As he exhibited symptoms of multiple sclerosis, had an MRI scan, but a spinal tap last month showed Torres does not have the disease. Torres also suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, which he manages through therapy and volunteering with veterans organizations in Chicago. He says he wishes TEPCO would have done the right thing and told U.S. officials about the nuclear meltdown before sailors were exposed to radiation. When I was deployed in the Middle East, I had a team of sailors and I would look after their wives and children. 
I'm going to make sure your mom and dad are okay, and I wish someone would have done that for me. There are people that are dying from the carrier. They need to know what these people endured and help get the help that they need. We are seeking justice. Torres and Patowski are part of the class action of over 420 sailors suing TEPCO and General Electric in San Diego's federal court. While 80 of the sailors plaintiffs have already died, most from cancer, since then the first case was filed in 2012. Many others have yet to experience any symptoms and want TEPCO to foot the bill for medical monitoring and testing of future health care costs over their life. The class is represented by high profile attorney former Senator John Edwards and his daughter Kate Edwards. In a phone interview Kate Edwards said there are 23 plaintiffs living with cancer, many of whom have served in Fukushima in their early 20s, some as young as 18 years old. In addition, the group facing cancer diagnoses, many of the sailors have degenerative diseases with some losing mobility and the use of their arms and legs, in addition to experiencing back problems and eyesight loss. A 26 month old toddler born to a sailor's father who served in Fukushima died from brain and spine cancer. Another female sailor opted to end a pregnancy after finding out the fetus had severe birth defects, Edward said. Where are all these young, healthy, fit people getting cancer? Experiencing thyroid issues. It's too strange to be a coincidence, Edward said. It just doesn't happen. Absent some external cause. All these people experience the same thing and were exposed to radiation at Fukushima. A lot of this is just common sense. The class has been fighting to get their day in court and get a trial date set. But the California's Ninth Circuit judge ruled in favor of General Electric, actually encouraging GE to continue engineering and manufacturing faulty designs. Even if they wipe out the greatest oceans on Earth and endanger billions of people, they have been cleared from the liability. And then bring in another piece, lay it down towards the ocean, another straight piece of pipe and another and another until you get it out to the ocean. And then you've got to have some poor people running in there and bolt it up in our Humvee. We suggested to them last night, yesterday, that they get some Humvees and strap lead to the Humvees like they strap metal and order the Humvee itself. I don't know how much shielding a Humvee gives, but put lead on a Humvee because one of the things is they're getting all that dose and that transit time to get the job to and from. Okay, go ahead. Casto? I think maybe I told you. I can't remember exactly what I all told you. But the water drops don't seem to be effective. The dose rates were not altered at all. You probably already know that. Yeah, we're watching them on TV. And I can imagine they are not being very effective. You know that stuff they're doing. You know, initially the fire trucks and now, then they had the riot spray pumps and then yesterday, you know, probably about 36 hours ago, they brought in that airport super high capacity remote unmanned pumper truck. Brian, yeah, moniker. And also that the helicopters, all those systems are really not highly effective. They're actually just marginally effective. And you know, the problem is, I mean, we're shooting from so far away, you have incredible losses, right? Moniker? So that's so, that's all. So yes, we've been concerned with Unifor all along. Jim Wiggins. Okay, speaking of deposition and things like that, a couple news. We got, we reached agreement with NARAC on what, let me also say, the president's source term. The one that, you know, you had agreed to. Jazzco? Yes, Wiggins. And it's it's been a bit challenging to get runs from NARAC, but we understand that running those now. Jasco, okay. Wiggins. And you know, it took some cajoling with them. They had some issues with how the source term was stated. Jasco, okay. Wiggins. But again, I've seen they've agreed to run it. Jasco, okay, good. And remind me again what that is at this point. There's been so many back and forth on this. Wiggins? Yeah, I know, you know, I still won't let anybody use the word worst case in the room here. Chairman Jasko? Yeah. Jim Wiggins? 
Because there's about five worst cases. Jasko, right. Jim Wiggins, what? What's the, the president's case? It's, it's bounding. It includes the, the fuel in the three reactors, the fuel in the four spent fuel pools. It does not include the common spent fuel pool around Unit 4, nor Reactors 5 and 6 or any spent fuel pools there, and it's assumed a release based over a 4-5 to five day period. Spent fuel pool re rack reduced contaminating testing that will have to be approved by the NRR, LT prior to assurance. We absolutely know that the pool number 4, the, the walls have collapsed. That you can imagine. Yes. Jasko said. So again, just to repeat, we believe pool number four is dry, and we believe that one of the other pools potentially structurally damaged. Chuck Castle, that's correct. Jasko, okay, and again, Castle, that's the best we know. Jasko, yes, and we certainly know. I think we absolutely know that pool number four, though the walls have collapsed. We certainly know. That's what he says. Certainly know. And our chairman Jasko, okay. On pool number four, Jasko, and again, because I'm going to get asked this question, where's that coming from? I'm going to say it's from a team that is in Japan that is embedded, that is working closely with the Japanese utility and the Japanese regulatory agency. Is that correct? Castle, correct. Below from the NRC FOA documents, you cannot get inventory cooling above the bottom of the fuel. Castle, Yes, they can't keep, that's what I was told last night, you cannot get inventory above the bottom of the fuel. Bill Ruin, no, what's Jim told me? So it's drained. Right. Castle, right. Bill, yeah, right, right. Castle, that's what I was saying, you can't get water in it. Bill Ruin, yes, because there's no fuel pool left. Castle, right. Unit 3, he believes. So when they tried to put water in there, they couldn't because the walls had collapsed. There was no structure to hold that water because those walls were gone. The large sailor was naked in the middle of a roped off area below decks and he was none too happy. He kept saying, not my boots too, my wife just bought them for me. But they made him take them off anyway and he was in there naked. Then they made him scrub. We called Maurice Ennis, a navigator of the USS Ronald Reagan, one of the Navy's newest aircraft carriers. They gave him this really abrasive stuff that we used to clean the hull of the ship. It's sort of like a liquid sandpaper, and he had to scrub all over while everyone watched. Then he walked over to the sink and he rinsed it off and then came back and stood while they ran the Geiger counter over him. He had to keep doing it until the Geiger counter was quiet and then it was my turn. There was a dark turn to the Operation Tamadachi, the massive search and rescue effort launched on March 11, 2011. Off the northern coast of Japan, which had been ravaged by an earthquake and giant tsunami, the combined natural disasters left some 20,000 Japanese dead and the coastal infrastructure destroyed. Tomodachi, the Japanese word for friend, was an 80-day mission requested by the Japanese government and coordinated by the U.S. State Department and the Department of Defense. The DOD quickly mobilized its 63 Japanese bases and called in the USS Ronald Reagan carrying 5,500 sailors and marines along with its strike group consisting of four destroyers, the Preble, McCampbell, Curtis Wilbur, and the McCain, the cruiser USS Chancellorville, and several support ships. But the rescue mission quickly detoured down a dangerous uncharted path. The earthquake had cracked Unit 1 of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactors, and the tsunami had knocked out all the power to the safety systems controlling units 1 through 4. Also, Daini had their own issues. They had explosions at the Daini site, which is just a few clicks south of Fukushima Daiichi. Control of this mission was expanded to include the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy. 
The fuel in Unit 1 through 3 was quickly melting down. The fuel in Unit 4 had been offloaded to the spent fuel pool, which was located above the reactor itself, due to planned refueling. By March 15, explosions had blown the roofs off and the walls out on all four reactor buildings, and radiation was spewing into the air. There was no power to circulate water to any of these buildings, so the Japanese had to improvise. They borrowed high-powered pumping trucks from the Americans and poured water into the buildings. Yes, yeah, salt water, which was corrosive. <laughs> and they let it run through the spent fuel pools and reactors and out the bottom, where it flowed into the ocean. All the while, however, the Tokyo Electric Power Company and the Japanese government sought to minimize the radiological disaster. Yeah, minimize people talking about it. TEPCO would declare there was little or no radiation when in fact contamination was high and out of control. There are some 70,000 American service members and their families in Japan and defense officials were worried that they might have all have to be evacuated. Family members were evacuated from Yokosoka Naval Air Base 188 miles south of Fukushima when radiation was detected increasing in amounts there. It was those detections which convinced American officials that the Japanese were not being honest by calculating the amount of radiation that must have been released in order for Yokosuko to be threatened. NRC officials correctly deduced that despite Japanese assurances, the reactors had been breached. But the overriding concern was for the Americans in this land-based installations, the men and women of Operation Tomodachi were overlooked. And at times, they were just two miles off the coast of Fukushima as helicopters went back and forth, seeking survivors and transporting food and supplies. The Americans at sea were on their own, a growing fear. For Quartermaster Ennis, the way for decontamination was completely unexpected turn of events. The Quartermaster had two main responsibilities, navigating the ship and operating the signal flags attached to the mast which let others in the fleet know that the flagship was doing. Ennis had been ordered to bring down the American flag, which had been flying atop the mast for two weeks, and bring it to the captain's quarters. I brought it down, he said, and folded it, respectfully, and tucked it under my right arm, next to my body. I carried it inside and put it away and thought nothing of it. After dinner, he was walking past a sensor and the alarms all went off. He recalled and they began yelling at me not to touch anything or anyone and to go straight to the decontamination area. There was a line in the cordoned off decon area which men and women waiting to be checked. But Ennis didn't have to wait. He was already marked and he was ushered to the front. Where a table was played out under the watch flies of the Reagan's executive officer and senior medical officer. The naked sailor in the center of the room was given a towel to cover himself and they left. They called Ennis. They told us that there was no radiation, said Ennis. When they started putting up the stations along the ships to check for radiation, they didn't say why they were there. They checked my boots and nothing happened. Then they checked my hands and the machine goes crazy. The guy doing the checking freaked out and said, step away from him. Next thing I know, I got plastic bags on my arms and they are telling everyone to get away from me. I almost had an anxiety attack because they were treating me like I had the plague. They weren't touching me. They were yelling commands to where I had to walk and what I had to do. I had to scrub my hands on my right side with this gritty paint remover and it took off a couple layers of my skin. Ennis was not told then or later exactly what his radiation reading was. They did say his was the highest level recorded among personnel on the ship. At that time, however, the radiation level was not his main concern. Fear of the unknown consumed his attention. The officers were watching him, embarking orders. His fellow sailors, men and women, silently watched him from the edges of the decon station while waiting their turn to be checked for radiation. It was pretty embarrassing, San Ennis. You're half naked and getting yelled at and scrubbing in front of all sorts of people. I'm scared because they're not telling me what's going on. The way they acted, I thought I must be in real trouble. And it scared the crew. 
None of us were experts on radiation. You ask yourself, are you going to die? Are you going to get cancer? Are you going to be shipped off? I didn't know if my skin was going to bubble up or something. I didn't know anything. The Navy had been assured that radioactive particles could be washed away with soap and water. That was partly true. Particles emitting alpha rays, the weakest sort, could be washed away from smooth surfaces. Those emitting beta rays, which are stronger, can only be washed away as long as there are no breaks in the skin, providing pathways to enter the body. The abrasive paint removing soap used by the Navy, however, removed the top layers of the skin. In addition, the carrier's flight deck is not made of smooth plastic or glass. Merely scrubbing would not remove particulates from such porous surfaces. The Reagan's crew had been assured that there was no radiation to worry about over the open ocean and at the ship's navigator. Ennis had been led to believe that the radiation was a distinct plume that could be avoided. It was now apparent that the radiation cloud was everywhere, and avoiding it would not always be possible. On the quarter mile long deck, there was another alarming note. I had a digital watch, said Quartermaster James Pline, and it suddenly stopped working. Somebody made a crack that radiation would do that. There were five or six of us on deck, and everyone looked at their watches, and all the digital watches had stopped. There was this one real expensive watch, and that wasn't working either. We were sort of laughing at first, but then it wasn't funny anymore. And those of us that were below the decks had even less information to go on. The jet mechanics, said Jennifer Mick, had most of the aircraft parts brought down to them for testing. There was limited access to the huge hangar elevators. They sat up a hatch watch, Mickey recalled, which was people from the air squadron sitting in folding chairs, making sure no one on deck through the catwalk. They were to enter and exit only through the front of the ship because they wanted to reduce the level of contamination in the rest of the ship. So they would pretty much sit there all day and yell at people who went the wrong way. Mickey knew the jets on the flight deck were in a radioactive environment. Every time we came off the flight deck, she said, some guy would have to scrub your boots and toss them in a pile and take them away. When you're going up on the deck, you would put on a pair of boots over your regular boots so they would have to throw those away. Then we'd have the chemical, biological, radiological suits that we had to put on. We were issued masks and canisters, but we never ended up actually using them. How well these precautions worked is an open question. An aircraft carrier is a complex industrial town, and at any given time, major and minor pieces of equipment are broken. Some of the damages came from normal wear and tear, and other damages came from accidents. During Operation Tomodachi, the effectiveness of putting rags under the doors to limit the spread of airborne radiation was compromised by the fact that there was broken doors, broken door jams and seals, and in some places watertight doors which had been removed and taken to the Reagan's machine shop for repairs. On paper, the USS Ronald Reagan was a series of closed compartments. In reality, it was more of a floating catacomb with the air flowing fleetly through it. In the real world, okay, in this first screen capture, shows that other countries were warned, were given rainwater warnings after the multiple meltdown at Fukushima, Japan on March 20th of 2011. You know, we weren't given rainwater warnings, not at all, <clears throat> but other countries were. And in this screen capture, you can see the, uh, the outline of the couple holding an umbrella with their child underneath, and there's clouds and rain coming down, and in the rain are the nuclear, the yellow and black nuclear uh, symbols. And obviously one is Japan, that goes without saying, but Britain, okay, United Kingdom were given rainwater warnings and leafy vegetable warnings, and France, as far away as France, were given rainwater warnings and leafy vegetable warnings. However, in the United States, children and American citizens were indeed sacrificed to protect the nuclear industry. Online and again decide for yourself what you think the story is, but just keep an open mind and always remember look at the opposing side's point of view. 
if you're a follower of particular media outlet A, B, or C, or X, Y, or Z, and, and their story is different than mine, please look at my story and vice versa. If I give you a story but someone else says, hey, we have a different version, go look at all the information because until you have garnered the entire amount of information you can possibly have, you're, you can't make that ultimate informed decision for yourself what you believe, okay? And quickly, before I take off, I'm going to read to you, and this will finish this video, the eight things very quickly that I have found in these FOIA documents that everyone's avoiding through mainstream, through alternative, the anti-nuke figureheads won't talk about it, all these YouTube channels that I believe are controlled opposition, all these Facebook pages and characters I believe are controlled opposition. It is huge and it is stunning and overwhelming when you realize how many are avoiding such a serious topic and that it cannot be an accident or coincidence, okay? Number one, the world's largest provable cover-up involving President Obama and multiple agencies. That's the big that's the big one found in these documents. Proven, proven. I've made the case. Something wicked this way comes. Please read my book. It's totally free. I've never asked for money and never will. Number two, Navy ships were knowingly exposed to high levels of radiation. I have a screen capture where they say if you're worried about having angst about moving Navy ships, run a bunch of worst case scenarios and pick the least worst case scenario and you won't have to move the Navy ships. I'm paraphrasing there, but it's pretty close to what the guys say. Number three, TEPCO. Intentionally discharge radioactive water into the Pacific since April of 2011. I proved that with documentation where TEPCO admitted it. In these documents all along, TEPCO had already admitted that. Now, had all these media outlets and figureheads dug into these documents like I told them to begin with, they would have found early on TEPCO was dumping that one. They could have proved it. Instead, they did nothing that TEPCO's admission of dumping, intentionally discharging high-level, in some cases, high-level radioactive water into the Pacific, that was proven in the documents. Now, after I posted up that particular video and wrote about that, yes, mainstream began to leak out the fact water was going into the Pacific, and now it's all over the place. They avoided these documents, and again, folks, myself and other researchers sent this information around to all your favorite alternative media outlets. We beg these anti-nuke figureheads to talk about it, and they won't. We send them the information, we prompt them, they ignore us. I'll leave you to your own conclusion on that, although I have my opinion on that, and I'm, I'm uh, vocal about it. Number four, Bechtel hosed the American public for $9.8 billion for their pumping system that Japan didn't want, and they were vocal about it. They said they didn't want it. They tried to push it on them in the, in the end. Japan didn't want to pay for it. Guess what? The DOD pays for it. Aren't that nice? $9.8 billion, and you, the taxpayer, will end up footing that bill for pumps that TEPCO Japan didn't even want. Bechtel made the money on that little debacle. Number five, a quote-unquote Japan earthquake and tsunami drill occurred simultaneously as a Fukushima event. Many of you know that during 9-11, Vigilant Guardian was being run, a, a drill that was simultaneously run. Many of you are aware of the Federal Building drill, the Oslo bombing drill, the Aurora drill, Sandy Hook drill. It goes on and on, so on and so forth. Indicated in these documents is that there is a drill that occurred between utility execs from Japan and NRC. Okay, and NARAC was involved in so on and so forth. It's quite a huge conspiracy, and like I say, hundreds if not thousands are going to you know, have to be arrested before this is all over. And so that's also an important thing that we found in these FOIA documents that nobody seems to want to talk about or mention. Six, there is evidence that we have many non-seismically qualified spent fuel pools here in the U.S. That should worry you. Number seven, our nuclear plants are not prepared for a tsunami slash earthquake co-event of the Fukushima magnitude. That should worry you as well. And finally, number eight, Unit 4, and Unit 3 for that matter, lost all its fuel in a pyrophoric fire and likely released its radiation directly to the atmosphere. And I provided a lot of evidence of that. I'll link to my fear and loathing and to something wicked this way comes. And that pretty much sums up this particular video. I wanted to cover those eight points from what I found in these documents that they don't want to talk about. It's very revealing once you know the important subject and who all is unwilling to speak about it. Okay, so that covers it for this video. I'm sorry it took so long, but this information was critical to get out there to you, the American public, and uh, uh, we'll talk to you again later in a future video. This is Patrick Penry, over and out. And thank you to the regional folks who fielded a number of calls about our response and the impact of the Japanese situation on our plants. Some things worked very well. 
The blog was a great way to get information out besides our standard press releases. And NSIR released access to YouTube and Twitter by midday Sunday so we could do more monitoring of what information was quote unquote in the public domain. Let me read that to you again, folks, in case that went by and you didn't catch what that was. Again, I told you I was going to give you some stuff this week that's going to blow your socks off. Here it is again. Some things worked very well. The blog was a great way to get information out besides our standard press releases. And NSIR released access to YouTube and Twitter by midday Sunday so we could do more monitoring of what information was quote unquote in the public domain. Again, they are given special privy access to YouTube and Twitter to monitor what? The few independent people that are trying to actually give you the freaking honest truth, folks. This makes me mad. This makes me hot under the collar. Because while we're desperately trying to get real-time, real information to public citizens for what? To make money? For what? Fortune and fame? No, to save freaking lives. The lives of children. The lives of kids, man. And look, at here's NRC. Here's what they do best, folks. They hide from the American public. They hide the danger we were all in. Again, think of it as if a guy has a bonfire in the back of his yard and he's throwing all his trash on it, gets out of control and starts burning off through the woods towards your neighbor's house. And this huge fire that you started at your house, for innocent enough reasons maybe, has burning out of control at your neighbor's house. What do you do instead of warn your neighbors? No! You keep your mouth shut. You tell everybody it's not as bad as everyone thinks. It burns your neighbor's house down, it kills them all in the house, and then what do you do? You begin a massive cover, and plus you monitor social media, you monitor YouTube, you want to know what people are talking about, the fire you created to burn the house down and killed all the people. That is a fair analogy. Department of Justice! Department of Justice! Where are you? What are you guys doing up there? What the heck's going on in the Department of Justice? You know what I think? I think it's for anything but justice. I think it's a Department of Evasion of Justice, right? Protection from Justice. That must be what, what else can I conclude, folks? What can I conclude? In National Security IR, NSIR, released access to YouTube and Twitter by midday Sunday so we could do more monitoring of what information was quote-unquote in the public domain. Hey, if nuclear power is not dangerous, if it's a good, if it's clean, if it's refreshing, if it's wonderful, as Obama and Mitt Romney, and, all, and even Ron Paul won't talk smack about it, folks. Even Ron Paul doesn't seem to have a problem with nuclear power. If it's that innocuous, uh, why do you have to hide everything? Why are you? Why you have to monitor us? We're just trying to figure out what the heck's going on and get it out there to the people. Because you won't. Because you will not. Okay, this is a crime. This is a willful, one premeditated crime. Let me continue reading. Please take the time Monday morning to review all the press releases that went out and the blog posts as well. Again, they have their blogs. They have their blogs. They have their YouTube channels too. You know, after reading this today, and thank you very much, Shazam, what can I say? After reading this today, it blew my mind because I said to myself, I wonder how many blogs the NRC controls. But seriously, they hire outside uh, companies to do this kind of management. Millions of dollars are spent searching social media to counter what I am telling you today. When I read you the list of YouTube channels that are willing to discuss Plumegate, I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there are 30 times that many with 30 times as many subscribers that will never touch upon it because they are controlled by who? The nuclear industry, the energy monopoly that controls planet Earth. Their funds are friggin' unlimited, and they can print money if they have to. They own those guys as well. They own their ass. They own Obama. They own the Treasury Department. They own all of Congress, and what they don't own is compartmentalized or ignorant or just don't know, but that's very few. I can tell you three or four congressmen that actually wrote letters and spoke up and asked questions. That's it. That's all I can tell you. That's all I can tell you. Meanwhile, NRC search and social media posting up their own blogs. What do their blogs say? No, there's no way radiation can get over here. You're perfectly safe. Everything's fine. Meanwhile, people are dying. What the freak? I mean, how am I supposed to do this stuff without getting somewhat angry because children have died because of this? Anyone who says otherwise, a damn fool, bought and paid for, or has no business talking about this. You really don't. You should study Chernobyl. You should study Three Mile Island. You should study the effects of nanoparticulates when they're carried aloft into the jet stream and float around the northern hemisphere. You know, Plume Gate, the plume is still circling every 40-something days. Radchick talked about that. Maybe you want to start paying attention to her and paying attention to what's going on because we're all getting radiated. Are they telling us about it? No. 
Obama is a PR. He's a figurehead. He comes out, so you have nothing to worry about. The reality in the FOIA documents, again, Alex Jones won't talk about it. Mainstream won't talk about it. How are we going to prevent another meltdown, one over here in the States, and people getting blasted here? Do you think, ladies and gentlemen, because they lied all about Plumegate, they covered up and conspired to conceal and hide the plume and radar to fall? Do you honestly think they're going to be honest with us when there's a meltdown, a serious meltdown over here? Seriously, you better reconsider. You should reconsider. Listen to what I'm telling you now. They're searching social media, and they are countering what we say. They put five uh, uh, YouTube channels up from my one. It's probably more than that. That's a conservative estimate. Straight out of the protocols of the Wiseman of Zion pertaining to the control of the press. That's protocol number 12. I have an analysis of this on my WordPress blog. Please read about it. Because like I say, they re make the lie big. Repeat the lie often, and you only have to fool most of the people most of the time. The first hurt, nothing derogatory meant by it, but they're totally asleep, totally oblivious about the incredible damn seriousness of the situation. Where It's even worse. And there's been no move in this country to release suppressed alternative technology. Okay, there's no move in this country to dismantle, to decommission, and to get rid of these nuclear facilities. We're waiting. We're waiting for when, for when. And when it happens, you ain't going to know nothing. You're not going to get to know anything. 